I want to go ahead and get started and welcome everybody uh, for our first edition of the PPD webinar series. This uh, series that we're going to focus on um, this month or this week is an introduction into RGB and how does it work and what is this crazy stuff. And this is truly a topic I haven't actually touched on uh, in a webinar. But uh, it's going to connect a, a number of dots. Now, if uh, a number of you folks are uh, longtime listeners or long time uh, been in the hobby, this is going to be all old hat to most people. But we're doing this more for the about 450 people who have joined Pixel Pro University on our Facebook group. You can go to Pixel Pro, uh, you can go to facebook.com forward slash Pixel Pro University. And that's our Facebook group. If out of out of the 500 people that have joined PPU in the past three months, this is meant for you. So uh, we always get the basic questions all the time. So I felt it was important to just go ahead and start with the basics. So and that's our goals. Our goal is to start with the basics. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss. RGB pixels, we're going to uh, talk about controllers and their role in, in, in how everything works. And then we're also going to discuss data and networking um, and what they have to do with the whole thing. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. What is RGB? Now, um, the, the easiest way to think of RGB, if you are new to this, is it's the same technology that's found in your television. Um, you have a television. Each television has pixels, a pixel count. Uh, you might have heard of the term 1920 by 1080. That, that refers to the pixel count wide by the pixel count tall in your monitor or your television. And each individual pixel is individually addressable, meaning that you can tell one pixel to be one color on the television. And if you put enough pixels close enough together and side by side and change the colors gradually, you can build different images across that screen. And that is what RGB technology is. So what we use in our hobby, our lighting hobby, is we use uh, something called a pixel, which has three micro LEDs in it. It has a red uh, LED, a green one, and a blue one. And between those three colors combined, those three colors can create over a million different color combinations. So um, if, you're, if you're looking at a TV, you have millions of pixels in, in an 8K or a 4K TV, you have millions of pixels in your screen. But if you have a pixel display, now it's the displacement of pixels that you have on each prop that matter and allow you and where they're spaced on your display how you move the light across from one area to another how many of those you have the definition that you put in your display uh, it, it, it gives you that ability to make changes and be much more vivid uh, and you can tell the definition between one prop and another prop because of how they're programmed so uh, mixing these three colors can uh, you know create any color on the rainbow um, the lighting hobby has four of the most the, the most four common types. There's more, obviously there's more, but the most four or the four most common types of RGB, um, I would call them props or appliances, would be pixels as you see in the bottom left here, floodlights which you could see in the bottom right. There's a building with lights that are um, um, uh, pushing light onto the building, flooding the building, and then you have what, what's well known to many people in the hobby is uh, LED strips, which make very nice straight lines. Uh, and then you have P10 panels. So this is a picture of one of my P10 panels. Um, it's just a tune to sign. So uh, the variations, there are variations with pixels. Some of them are a little bit more advanced than others, meaning they have other options such as RGBW. So we're used to red, green, blue, and RGB, but some of them are RGBW. They're four channel, as they're known, where they have four different channels that you can activate, and you can activate a white channel as opposed to have it having to activate the RG and B to create the white. The white channel exists, so you only turn on that channel when you're sequencing or programming. 
Um, but the, the most common type that we use are bullet or square node pixels, and they are typically RGB, and that's exactly uh, what we're using in uh, today's examples. So uh, what does it take to run pixels? Well, again, we're sticking with just the basics. So um, when we look at the basics, there is, like I said earlier, bullets and square type pixels. Um, the next basic that we need to know to run pixels is we need data. We need to find a way to send data out. And the data comes from two places. Number one, it comes from the software that we're outputting from. And then uh, skipping down to the bottom one, it comes from the controller. So the software pushes data out to the controller. It does that via the network, meaning the way of sending coded data from the computer, from the sequencer, from, for example, XSchedule or FPP out to a controller, which then decodes it from what's known as E131, and it translates it into physical data for pixels. So that's the basics. That's exactly what we're talking about when we do an RGB light display. So here's a couple of FYIs in, in, in pixel format uh, in bullet, uh, bullet notes here that you can see. Uh, I, I quickly snapped these this evening, and I thought it would be helpful to have this as a kind of a reminder that, uh, that, that there are certain uh, aspects about pixels that everybody needs to know. Like the very first things, what do you need to know about pixels? Um, well, the, I would say the first thing is, is the most common types are 12 volt and 5 volt. Um, I, in this instance, I grabbed the 5 volt pixel. Uh, there are far less uh, components on a 5 volt pixel than there are on a 12 volt pixel. Um, and that's due to the uh, power that is used in order to uh, run those. So, uh, and in some instances, uh, many instances, most pixels are 12 millimeters wide, and that's the distance that uh, you see here with the yellow arrows between pointing between these two dimples on the sides of the pixels. What's nice about these pixels is when you push a 12 millimeter pixel into a 12 millimeter hole, these dimples hold the pixel or help to hold the pixel in place, and you, you have like a millimeter there where it can sit on some sort of substrate and hold itself in a pointed direction. So that's what's nice about the way the pixel boots are designed. They're designed at a 12 millimeter hole. Um, a lot of, uh, you'll hear, hear a lot of people say things about um, uh, recommending the, uh, the, the wire gauge, the thickest wire gauge that you can get. Well, traditionally it's 18 gauge is the wire that you want. Um, you'll notice that some pixels are cheaper than other pixels. And so we always want to be mindful that pixels come in different gauge wire. The thinner the gauge, the wire, the less power that can actually run through the line. So going with an 18 gauge wire pixel is always the best idea. If you do run thinner wire, like 20 or 22 gauge pixels, don't try to overload an output with more pixels because it, it, that, that wire just kind of stifles the amount of power that, that the last pixel on the end of the line can get to. So it's always, it's always best to go with 18 gauge wire. Um, also, it's recommended that you use pixels that are hard filled with epoxy resin as opposed to silicone. Uh, there are soft pixels and then there's hard pixels. You want the hard pixels. And the reason for that is epoxy resin is far more uh, resilient than the silicone. The silicone can work for a number of years, but after a few seasons, it can shrink. And if it shrinks, as you can see here, uh, all of these components, that leaves, that if it shrinks, it allows water to get in here. And obviously if water can get in, it can ruin the electronic co uh, components on the pixel. Um, so that doesn't mean that you can't use silicone pixels. It's just, you can use them on the inside of the house uh, or after a few years and they, you start having issues, take them inside, use them inside on something else. So a couple more FYIs that you should know about pixels. And this, uh, again, this is, uh, um, mostly dealing with the pixels that we that you see uh, mainstream. There there are uh, some specifics we'll get into. 
uh, in a few slides that uh, are a little bit that tell a little bit more different. Um, but data is directional in pixels. Uh, we typically use, uh, and I'll talk about this too, a 2811 pixel. Pixel data flows in one direction. It starts and goes from, let's say, left to right. Uh, data comes in and data comes out. Uh, if, in fact, if I were to uh, go back to this slide, you could see this arrow here, and this points the direction that the data is going uh, from this uh, pixel. So this side here, where the black uh, I, uh, IC chip is, um, is data in, and this arrow denotes data going out. So this would be the back end, this would be the front end or the input. So with that in mind, uh, this kind of uh, makes a little bit more sense that whenever you talk about data in and data out, uh, which if I go back again, uh, sometimes instead of seeing the arrow here, you'll see a D and an I right here in the middle as opposed to seeing the arrow. Uh, you may see on this side, it may say DO or DI. It depends. You can't just look at a pixel and say this is the input this is the output you want to look for the letters di or do or you want to look for this arrow to help you signify where the data either comes in or comes out at so you know where to start the string and why that's important is on this slide right here so uh, we use what what are called pigtails which are connectors and some pixels come with the most standard uh, of, of uh, connectors, and they're called JSTs. Now, I didn't take a picture of a JST connector. It's, it's thin plastic, small. Um, typically, they're not waterproof, but you can use them, and if you use them with dielectric grease, they actually work pretty decent. Um, they are simple to work with, but m most people opt for what you're about to see here, which are X-Connect or Rewu. There are a number of other ones. Uh, I, I, I don't even want to begin to to say one is better than another, but I will say that the X-Connect uh, happen to be my, be my current favorites. Uh, I've used Ray Wu pig, uh, pigtails for years, but uh, the X-Connects are much easier for me to push together and tighten up. Um, uh, again, the, the final thing I want to bring up on this slide here is pigtails are used to connect one string to another. And when, when you look at these pigtails, you can see that there's a male end, meaning you have a metal tip end, and then you have a female end, which has the holes on it that line up and match with each other. Match with each other. And um, typically the male end is where the beginning of the string is located, and the female end is the end of the string where data flows out. So male end, the data flows into from the controller, and the female end, the data flows out. So another thing we want to talk about is software. Now, this is by no stretch of the imagination an exhaustive list of uh, software that is available. The, the most common uh, pixel uh, sequencing software that you're going to see for home users is going to be uh, Lightarama, Xlights, and Vixen. Those are the three big dogs. Um, I, I know Lightarama has worked really hard over the past uh, five years to really um, expand on their ability to program with pixels, which was five years ago much more challenging. Uh, but Xlights has been a free software, as well as Vixen, uh, a free software with a number of uh, devoted developers who have worked through a number of projects. And uh, that typically is where we at PPD usually rest in, and, and utilize the, the software to make all of our uh, sequencing and, and, and work with other folks in the hobby. So if you do, if you do have Lightarama or Vixen, uh, Madrix is a, is a uh, commercial company. We use uh, Madrix in, in a number of commercial installs. So uh, not typical to go out and purchase Madrix to use it, but uh, Lightarama is a software that you have to purchase. Xlights is free to use. The developers uh, do take donations. And same thing with Vixen. Developers uh, offer the software for free and uh, they do take donations as well. Um, so as I already said, the, the 
Lightorama is uh, Lightorama and X lights are, are the two most popular ones that, that you'll see. Uh, this is a personal preference. You there's no uh, you can't say one software is better than another. I mean you could get into arguments uh, all day and all night. It's like saying five volt pixels are better than twelve volt pixels, which we all know that's the truth. But uh, that'll be an argument till the end of time. Um, all software has a learning curve, so if if you're getting into this hobby and you're looking to do this with a massive display and it's your first year, there is a huge learning curve that you have to have. And it's not that you're just learning software, you're also learning and understanding the basics of what we've already talked about, which is pixels, uh, how the pixels get data, and how, you know, the, just in general, the steps that you have to go through in order to make your house flash to music. Uh, it, it, it's not something that is natural, quick, and easy to learn. It's something that there are a number of us who have spent years perfecting what we do. And when we say years, we start in January and we work all the way through the year until November and then into December we continue working because we're getting ready for the next January. So uh, this isn't just a, uh, a 10 month or a four month or a two month hobby. This is a whole year that we spend doing this. Um, more challenging uh, when you only use this for one season each year. So what basically what I mean, if, if you don't use the software often, or if you don't use uh, uh, the knowledge that you gain often, if you don't write yourself some notes, if you don't uh, follow up with yourself with, you know, go back and review things by the, by the beginning of next season when you put everything up or, uh, or two years from now, you spend all year learning it and then you take a year and you relax because boy, that was a lot of work and you need a break. You will lose a lot of what you learn because you haven't used it. So, um, and the last thing is is the holidays. I mean, you after you're done, I mean, you're you're basically exhausted. But if you have that drive and desire, uh, then you keep going with doing small things throughout the year, and that way, that lessens what you're losing in the off season. Kids, kids go through this actually, right? You know, the kids during the summertime, they do, it's called the summer slide. Kids, you know, work, 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 work all through the season, all through the school year. Summer comes, they have a great summer off and then they come back and it's, it's not that they got dumb all of a sudden, it's because they haven't used the information that they've been working with through the whole year. And it feels like they slid back. And so they don't just open up the book into the next semester, which keeps going, and just you know pick up where they left off. They try to, but you you lose what you're not using. So that's why it's important to keep up with this. Uh, and as you do, it'll become a lot easier uh, through uh, repetition. So let's get on to sequencing. And what exactly is sequencing? Uh, I call it programming. That's the other word that I use for it. So you can use one or the other. Uh, the act of placing a physical effect on one of your props. So for example, uh, as you see here in this screen, this is a screenshot of X lights and these are uh, whatever props are listed here and different effects have been placed exactly at specific start times. You can see that the length of time here matches up with the length of time up on the timeline and the waveform. And then you can see the different effects and uh, how they physically look on the screen, but you can also push the play button and see how those effects interact with each other. So that's basically what sequencing is, is the act of putting a, an effect on a prop at specific times and adjusting it to make it work a certain way. Uh, you're coordinating the beginning and end time of the effect with the music. Uh, perhaps it's to the beat, perhaps it's syncopated, perhaps it's a slow fade in over a long period of time. Um, and probably one of my favorite questions that everybody seems to ask is, how long does it take to sequence a song? And the, the answer is, is it's a really hard question to answer. Um, first, in order to sequence, you have to learn, um, you have to learn what the effects are. And that takes time and that depends on how long you're going to spend sitting in front of the computer and playing with the 50 plus effects that are available in x lights for you to use 
uh, then after you start using them, there's a ton of options that each of these effects have. And learning those options and how they change and adjusting and manipulating them, that's a whole different ball of wax. Uh, we've, we've done a significant number of videos in the past of, of each individual effect that, that's available in Xlights that's a graphic effect, the bars effect or the single strand effect. You can search for those uh, on the website. but to learn all of that, that's the challenge. To, to just say, oh, this is the effect I want to use right here because I want it to do this. Until you know what the effects do, it's going to take longer for you to sequence. But here's the challenge. Once you learn and you understand what the effects do, let's say you do nothing but sequence. Now, again, sequencing takes time. But once you, once you learn how the effects work, and you do spend time sequencing, learning to improve that skill and the detail of your sequencing begins to change because once you can do something that seems basic and then you add something else extra to it where you add a layer or you begin using transitions, then pretty soon you say, okay, well, what I did last year looks really terrible. I need to update all my old stuff to this new way that I've been learning how to do. And so what ends up happening is a standard song for you can take 20 hours to program. That's three minutes long. Uh, way up to an advanced level, whenever you know what every effect does, where it can take me 65 hours to sequence one song that's three minutes long on the layout that you see in front of you. So it, it, there's no good answer to this. It's all in what you like. It's all in... Uh, it, you know, it's art, it's subjective, it's things that you appreciate. So whenever you think about sequencing, it's probably one of the most time consuming things. Most people love to build props. Most people love to put things up. One of the last things that they like to do is sequence and they realize it's November 15th, it's November 20th. Oh, it's Thanksgiving day. I don't have my sequences started. So um, it, it's something to keep in mind that it takes time to learn how to do that side of it as well. So next we want to move on to another basic which is networking. And what we're going to talk about here is um, uh, obviously the basics of uh, the network cable and uh, the basics of a computer. So uh, we're going to start with what a, a show network is. Basically a show network is nothing more than and I'll go back to this, a computer hooked up with a network cable going out to what we'll talk about next is a controller. So the computer can put out data called E131. And what this basically is, is this is something called DMX. Don't worry about what DMX is. DMX is a protocol and it's sent out over the ethernet or the network cable that's connected to the back of your computer. It uses cat5 or cat6 network cables um, and and you can use wireless transmission uh, but that's a higher level complexity. I want again I want to keep it basic. Uh, to the right here you see a network switch and basically what a network switch is is it takes data from a something that transmits data and it splits it off into extra outputs for other devices to plug into. Kind of like a, in this instance, a five-way um, outlet plug where you plug one uh, plug into it from the computer and the other four will instantly pick up that other data, that data coming out from that fifth output and send it out to the other four. It pushes data further. It's, it, it's basically like a, a five-prong outlet for your network. And what this allows you to do is you it allows you to send data to multiple controllers throughout your show that are located in different areas that aren't close together where that you can easily connect them. And so don't think of a show network as being complicated. Just think of a show network as being a computer with a network cable going out to a controller. I have a, a graphic at the end that will be a little bit more clear and, and kind of walk through that as well. Uh, network switches typically in a show network can be simple by being an unmanaged switch. Unmanaged switches are typically 
10 to 20 bucks. They're very inexpensive. In this instance, it's a 100 megabyte or or a thousand megabyte, excuse me, uh, or a gigabit switch. It can it can handle uh, uh, the higher data trans, uh, transfer rate uh, for for network data. I don't want to get too bogged down with network. Just know that a network is nothing more than a computer with a network cable going out to a controller. It can get ridiculously complicated the more complicated you want to make it. But there are ways to do the things that you'd like to do, uh, but you can always keep it very simple. Most people, most people will start with a secondary computer in their house and run a network cable out to their computer or for, to their show co controllers or to a network switch. That's usually how people get started. Uh, data. So there's two kinds of data. Um, we already talked about network, which kind of I kind of floated the word earlier it was called E131, and that's DMX over Ethernet. Don't worry about DMX. Just know that E131 means it's going out through the network cable from your computer. That's all you need to know. But there's also another type of data, and we call this pixel data. And pixel data is created whenever E131 hits a controller and the controller converts it into pixel data or data that it can speak to the pixels with. So uh, most common protocols that we see in pixels and there's different types, there's hundreds, I mean there's protocols out there that are just make your head spin. We have uh, most common though is 2811s. There's also uh, WS2801s. They're a four wire pixel. 2811s, WS2811s are a three wire pixel. There's only three wires. Uh, USC 19s, uh, TM 1804s, and lots, lots more. Um, uh, as I said earlier, pixel data travels in a specific direction. It goes in one side of the chip and out. Uh, outside the other uh, end of the chip. Uh, some pixels are special. They, they like 28 WS2812s uh, or 13s, they can transfer data in their omnidirectional, they can either direction, it doesn't matter. The end of the string can be the beginning of the string. Whatever gets it first is the first pixel. Um, but when you stick with one type of pixel, and the most common one, and the reason we go with the most common one is because it's the most um, budget friendly, I would suppose is the best way to say it. WS2811s, they, they're, they're what most, uh, all of the uh, US vendors are going to provide for you. They're going to be the one thing that if you order directly from China yourself, that's the one thing that you're gonna ask for is directly asking for uh, uh, a 2811 pixel. Um, also, the controller has to be told what's attached to it so that it knows the correct data protocol to send out to the pixel. So if you have pixel, pixels connected to your controller and they're not working right, well, one of the things, now it's not as common today, uh, it's a little bit more simplified today, but if you stick with the 2811s, most controllers are pre-configured to run 2811s. So if you have something odd like a 1903 or um, uh, 20, uh, 9813s, 9816s, I had those back in the day, um, then you have to physically go change that in the controller for that specific output in order for those pixels to activate because the E131, the network data, the DMX word again, if you send DMX to it or you send E131 to it, it's the controller can tell what it's supposed to do, but the data going out to the pixel from the controller may not know what it's talking to. So you have to talk in the same language. Um, so we always recommend use all 2811s. Just go with 2811, trust me. Uh, everybody in the hobby is gonna have 2811s. They're, it's gonna be the last thing when you have a problem. If you bought if you bought 2801s, which is a four wire pixel, and you need help, and you don't tell anybody they're 2801s, then nobody's gonna know to check that. That's just gonna be, that's a, that's a lost art now. So if you stick with 2811s, you're good to go. 
so here is um, a, a little short uh, rambling about controllers. Uh, I, I don't. A controller basically receives sequence data from uh, a, a source computer, a FPP. We said X schedule earlier before we got started. Um, and these, this data that comes in is E131. But what happens is, is the com controller converts that data and sends it out to the pixels per its specific output or pigtail, which obviously must be configured in order for that controller to know what is on the other end of that pigtail. So for example, if you have an output number one and you have a star that you're going to connect to the output number one and it's a 2811 pixel, they're gonna make sure that the first output is set up as 2811 data output. And then you're gonna make sure that you have the correct number of pixels that match your star. Let's say the star is a 90 count pixel star, which is pretty common. It's a normal size star, it's tw uh, 24 inches wide. And that star would need to be configured in a certain manner in the controller as well as the same manner in the software. So that way, whenever the controller or the computer sends out the data, then the controller receives the data and puts it out to the star. As long as all of those two match with the prop, everything's going to work. And it's going to work pretty easily. There are a lot of new things in x Lights and uh, some of the other software that make it so much easier for you now to uh, automatically configure uh, different things. I don't want to get into that. That's much more complex. But uh, just know that provided you plug in the right prop to the right output and you have made sure all the configuration is correct, the prop should work provided everything is set up correctly. So uh, just getting into the controller side of it, there are a number of controllers. I, I mean, this list is rather exhaustive. I'm not going to say every one of them. The most common controllers you're going to see on the market today are Falcon F16 V3s, V4s, and the Falcon F48s, um, the Culp K8, K16, K32s. Those are uh, growing in much growing in popularity. Uh, there is still a, a solid uh, user base for the PixLite 16 controllers, the PixCon 16. They're both the same controller. The PixCon 16 is from Lightarama. It, these are, uh, and by the way, these are all E131 controllers. I should mention that uh, E131 controller runs off of Ethernet data, uh, so and it has a network switch or a network adapter that you plug into. So you can see, uh, in this instance, this is uh, the next one here, Scott Hansen's board, which is a PV16 V2. I have two of these; they work phenomenal. They're they're my two favorite FPP controllers. Uh, zero problems with those. Really like those solid machines. Um, but the PixCon is a LOR controller, but it's also made by the same company who makes the PixLite 16. Those two work very well within the XLite software. They upload and communicate very simply with it. Uh, there's also a SAN device. These are older controllers, uh, E682s and E6804s. So there's also a Joshua P2 and a P12. These Again, this is these are older, but if you see these, they do work very well with x lights as long as you learn how to configure them. It might be harder to come across uh, information on how to make them work, and if you're not familiar with them, maybe you don't want to go with them, but they are solid controllers. They've always worked very well. There are other controllers. I'm not going to go through all of them, but, um, but these are the ones that are the most common. And the easiest, to be honest, the ones that are the most easiest to configure and work with and help other people in the hobby. Uh, and the, the, the last thing I want to do is I want to do just the basics. If you're considering uh, running uh, a light show, this is basically what all of this in this webinar is, comes down to. The first thing is you have to start with some sort of data that goes out to your props. So for example, we have the sequence down here. So once we sequence a song, we tell the computer to output this data via E131. So we create the data and we tell the computer output this to my show network using E131. Basically you have, let's say you have multiple controllers, you have multiple outputs, and you have multiple props. And you connect these props up correctly as the computer or as the sequencer understands those props to be connected. 
and the data flows as far as E131 is concerned from the computer to a switch or it flows directly to the controller and then it converts it into pixel data which we talked about earlier which is 2811 data and then that goes out to our props. So this is as basic as I can make it. Um, the, it there's, so, there's so many rabbit holes that we could go down and so many discussions that can be had. And um, for everybody out there who's watching, by all means, if you have questions, please feel free to put those questions in the comments down below this YouTube video. Uh, you'll find a ton of other information here uh, on our YouTube channel at Pixel Pro Displays. You can also find a ton of information on the PPD website, as well as if you join our Pixel Pro University Facebook group, which is an outstanding, quiet community that is easy on the folks that are inside the group. So with that, thank you all for watching. If you like the video, hit the like button. If you haven't done yet so, hit the subscribe button down below as well. If you, if you love the video, share it with everybody. And don't forget, if you appreciate the things that we do here at Pixel Pro Displays, consider joining the PPD Sequence Club where you get one awesome sequence each and every month with your monthly membership subscription. Folks, this is Clyde Lindsay. Thank you for joining us for this webinar.